Okay, before we kick off, I'm going to ask everyone on the panel maybe just to say who you are, where you work at, and what it is that your project does. So I'll lead by example. I'm Ads. I'm head of marketing at Pocket Network. Um, Pocket Network is building the universal RPC base layer. Hey guys, I'm Ganesh Swami. I'm one of the co-founders of Covalent. Covalent is the number one indexer that indexes on-chain data. Hi, I'm Connor. I'm an engineer for Celestia. Cool. I'm Peter. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Seda. We're a modular data layer, um, building as an L1 for data aggregation. And hi, I'm Zen. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Web3Off. We're the largest wallet as a service provider in the space, powering about 10 million users a month across different applications. Some of them you might have heard of, including Safe, Animoca Brands, um, Fox.com, Universal Studios, uh, McDonald's, uh, and the list goes on. That's a nice list. Um, we have probably one of the broadest topics today. So we're talking about growth and scalability. Um, so I would love to maybe just open it, maybe starting with you, Jen, to talk about where you think we are in the cycle. What, what is your feeling from within your business in terms of, of what you're seeing in terms of growth? Are you seeing um, uptake? Is, how does it compare to other cycles? Are there any differences? So um, we're mainly a B2B business in that we serve dApps and uh, both, both dApps trying to build in Web3 as well as applications oops, um, trying to move from Web2 to, to build on Web3. Um, and those are the two largest segments of the market. Um, for us and what we're seeing, we are seeing that I, we are full well into the bull. Uh, web 3 off. Our revenue is directly pegged to just customers coming on board and building on us. And our revenue in the past four months has gone up about 40%. So that's you know, about 12 to 15% month to month. I'm not sure if you guys are seeing the same uh, in particular, but it's, it's, for us, that indicates that we're full well into the bull. At least that's what we're seeing. Yeah, I agree there. Bull is starting. <laughs> Ganesh, same, same. So um, as a builder in the space for multiple years, I would say uh, I'm a perma bull. So it's always a bull market. And so a bear market is an opportunity for us to take a breath, uh, fix your infrastructure that was broken during a bull market, and then be prepared for the next bull market. So you're either hunkering down building or you're hunkering up and closing. So it's always a bull market. So I don't, don't really care about bull market cycles. So with that logic, what has changed during this last bear cycle? What are you bringing into the bull? What, are, what is different? How are you approaching your business, your growth? So generally in a, in a sales process, because we're also a B2B company, there's generally a, a problem unaware, solution unaware, vendor unaware before they sign on to your service. So I think today, um, at least in the last, I would say, 18 months or so, people were aware of the solution that blockchains offer. I think there's a lot more awareness in the industry. Um, there's like other kinds of use cases like NFT. Uh, DeFi was on the verge of being regulated away, but it's come back. I think uh, the SEC has lost a lot of lawsuits. Uh, you know, the center of tokenization uh, has moved outside the US to Singapore and Dubai. There's a lot more activity there. So I think those are very positive signs in the sense that may not necessarily lead to growth, but they're definitely removing barriers to growth. So I would say that is what has changed uh, in the last 15, 18 months. And now I was talking to Ganesh a little bit earlier today and he was telling me how many customers Covalent has and how there's a real mix, including big enterprise. I'm curious, are there any things that you've learned in terms of how you approach different customer types or you know, how, how anything anybody else could take from it? Absolutely, so I, I would say broadly there's uh, three kinds of customer types, uh, at least who are consuming the data and paying real revenues. There are the Web3 crypto native projects 
And most times that's a speculative use case. You know, uh, they really don't know whether this is long lived, it's an experiment, but it's not some uh, revenue that you can really build a business around. Because if there's a bear cycle, these applications, they kind of disappear. And then there's the true enterprises, which is typically a crypto native team that is embedded within a, a big giant web two company. So these are guys trying to fight their own internal systems. So they need to see the traditional enterprise uh, tooling, which is the business value, the business case, the build versus buy. And that's traditional enterprise sales. Even though the people you're selling on the other side is uh, a crypto native and is just like everyone else in this room. But even after you close that deal, you still have to go through the procurement process, which is another six months. And so that's a pretty elongated sales process. So the kinds of companies that can capture that kind of opportunity is very distinct. So you basically have to, I would say, uh, it's like Jekyll and Hyde, right? So you have to pick your game. You either have to you know, hang out with the crypto natives and build revenue that way, or uh, go down the enterprise route uh, and then build a traditional business. So these are, I think, different personalities and different go-to-market. And I'm going to pass the question over to Jen because we were talking slightly earlier about different customer types and, and what, what is happening with enterprise because I know you've had a lot of success with enterprise in the past and with Web2 companies in the past. Like, can, you, can you share what you were talking to me, to me about? Yeah, I mean, definitely. We, we, we were talking about the two different customer segments that um, typically use us and use uh, Covalent as well, I would think, is they're either Web3 native and are building for Web3 right off the bat and are dApps building in Web3 or Web2 companies moving into Web3. And these Web2 companies tend to be a little bit larger. They tend to be enterprises uh, and so on and so forth. So what we've seen different in this growth cycle relative to the growth cycle that was in 2022 uh, and 2021 is um, in 2021 and 2022, we saw a lot of growth coming from enterprises. A lot of people were excited. A lot of big brands were excited about building on crypto. Um, and that's where we saw a lot of the traction coming from. Fast forward to today, this growth cycle has been a little bit different, at least for us. I'm not sure about others. For us, internally, we've been seeing that more of the growth had just been coming from Web3 people building out of Web3 itself, and less from Web2. Um, it's the, the larger brands still are a little bit more cautious after FTX. Reputation of crypto is still a little bit, you know, especially when it comes to the West, not as high. Um, and then you combine that with high interest rates, the tech layoffs, people trying to like reduce teams. Innovation labs in these large enterprise companies can't bring a proposal to their board and go like, wow, I want like a 20 man team working on crypto. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the same flavor that we were seeing in 2022, 2021. And I think, I, I think what I'm picking up and what you're saying is that that's maybe just the phase that we're in in this cycle. Is that right? And it's not necessarily a negative, right? We're still seeing growth in the industry. It's just more out of native Web3 uh, like, um, applications that are designing for still mainstream, designing some still mainstream, some Web3, but just natively coming out of the box and through the weeds rather than from web two brands. So I think this, this concept of growth, I think, is a really interesting one kind of more broadly. Like I'm, I know that each of the panelists here have been in a position where you've seen very rapid growth at different points. Um, I'm, I'm sure we will get there again. And I guess as we come towards this phase of growth, I would love to just maybe uh, Peter, if you have a point of view on at what point is does growth become a problem? Like, yeah, I, I think like we saw. Gr Can you guys hear me okay? By the way, I know it's quiet. Um, I think we saw growth for our first party Oracle. Like it was parabolic. We launched it on Near Aurora and Evmos, and within eight weeks we were the second largest Oracle in crypto. We had like over 3.8 billion in total value secured, um, and that product did like over 150 billion in value enabled on chain. And when we were basically trying to scale this cross chain and basically move to different networks, we realized that we just couldn't, uh, we didn't have the capacity to do monitoring, to do security. 
and so with Seda, we kind of like went back to the drawing board, and I definitely agree with both of you guys. Like, um, you know, in the in the bear market, it's like you put your head down, you get ready to build, and you sort of like take a step back and say, what did we do wrong in the last cycle, and how can we improve this for the future? And so um, we were in the lucky position to raise a ton of money. We raised $22 million uh, from investors like Coinbase Ventures, Distributed, Reciprocal, and a bunch of other uh, really great backers. And um, that gave us the runway and the freedom to be able to really design something new. And so you know, where we look at SEDA is basically this, um, this layer where we're able to uh, basically aggregate any data intent from a protocol. So if a protocol wants to query like RPC data or wants to query um, you know, price feeds or whatever it may be, they're able to sign an intent on chain. Uh, that gets passed to the SEDA network. Our overlay network is able to call that data from any API and post it on chain. And that basically allows SEDA to be horizontally scalable to an infinite number of chains. So for us, we're able to uh, support um, over 230 networks at launch. Um, so we're doing our audit right now for our main chain, uh, getting ready to go live. Um, and so I think how we're setting ourselves up for this next cycle is like, we're not choosing losers or winners in the cycle. We're not saying, okay, this layer one or this layer two has a unique selling point. They're going to be able to really uh, push the boundary. So we're betting big and we're going to deploy there. We're just saying, hey, you can you know, launch our prover contract in 24 hours. Now you can access users, liquidity, and uh, price feeds. So your developers and your users have everything they need for a successful ecosystem to grow. And uh, that's sort of where we're positioning ourselves, just sort of like a, a Lego piece. I'm going to call out to the event, uh, you know, in this modular stack where, uh, you know, people can basically just get going with us from day one and not have to wait, uh, you know, a year for an integration to their chain. So I, I can't let a modular reference go by without um, pulling in Connor, because I think one of the things that, you know, quite rightly, a lot of people have been very excited about coming into this cycle has been advances around things like modular blockchain. I'd love you to talk to us a little bit about how that, how that can support us as we try to scale, as we try to kind of, you know, grow this industry? Sure. So Celestia can do a couple different things. And uh, we're known for supporting Ethereum L2s. But that is just one side quest. There also is a whole world of our own stuff that we're trying to do. We're trying to also have sovereign rollups which are like app chains that are on Celestia and they have many cool properties. Celestia is good at serving Ethereum L2s, but it's way better at the sovereign rollups. The sovereign rollups, much cooler, much more scalable, much more decentralized. Uh, but the Ethereum L2s that are supported by Celestia has been, so far, the most popular usage of our chain. Uh, Manta Network is our biggest user. On a panel today at East Denver, they mentioned that using Celestia saved them, uh, I forget the exact figure, it was a few million dollars in fees. So uh, we've grown a lot because of our ability to help Ethereum L2s save. And part of the strategy going forward is the thought that this, uh, this growth from supporting Ethereum L2s will accrue towards getting attention for our own ecosystem and eventually getting more people to look into sovereign rollups and all the possibilities that are enabled there. And what is exciting about your ecosystem? Because having been part of a project that's obviously been actively involved with Celestia, that we, we have seen a lot of really special things kind of coming through. I'd love you to maybe just share your point of view. Uh, yeah, so um, Pocket Network is one of the one of the first brave teams that is trying to build a sovereign rollup on Celestia, uh, and a sovereign rollup is like an app chain. So you could think of Manta as a scaling solution for Ethereum, a place where you can bridge your ETH and then do Ethereum type things, but cheaper. Whereas sovereign rollups are kind of like Cosmos app chains. And the difference there is, sure, there's no trustless bridge to Ethereum, but you do you, the thing that you get in exchange for that trade-off is the ability to hard fork. And a lot of people like that. A lot of people build app chains. As popular as it is to build an app as a smart contract on a general purpose chain like Ethereum, there still is attention on app chains. Some of these apps are actually switching to app chains from smart contracts. 
and the sovereign rollups are like we're better at serving the sovereign rollups that because because the ETH L2s don't really benefit from our sampling tech, but the SRUs do. Uh, so we are very excited to have Pocket on board and help us uh, dog food the the sovereign rollup meta. We're very happy to be there. Um, now, we only have a few more minutes. I don't know if people have questions. If you don't, I have one last thing I want to ask the panelists. Jen, do you have something you want to say? Just a really small question. Why do we call it a sovereign rollup if it doesn't have a L1? Isn't the purpose, isn't the Tom rollup definitive to aggregating proofs that are like translated down? We've been using the term sovereign rollup since 2019. And uh, no, like if you, so like, uh, this is like kind of a semantics thing. And so it's, I, I tend to not lose sleep over these semantics arguments, but technically, if you really want to be a pedantic nerd, a roll up is defined as something that, uh, that gets security from another chain's consensus and data availability. The definition doesn't actually have anything to do with fraud proofs or ZK proofs, technically although everyone associates it with that. So if you don't like the term and you want to call it something else, that's fine by me. Okay, one last question. I, I'm just curious to hear, you know, we're all decentralized infrastructure projects. That's part of the reason we've, we've, we came together to, to have these conversations. How do you see decentralization playing with growth? And, and I'm interested in kind of moving beyond decentralization of supply as part of it, but are there any other ways in which decentralization could be a strength in this? And I'm gonna target that to Ganesh, because we haven't heard your voice in a bit. All right, so a lot of people get into this space for a variety of reasons. Uh, decentralization can mean uh, something that's censorship resistant. It could be uh, unstoppable infrastructure. Uh, it could be permissionless. But I think for me, it's the, the proofs and the unhackable nature of decentralized technology that is uh, super exciting. And I think permissionless is uh, an ideal. I just don't think it's going to fly. Censorship resistance um, is not a thing that I've ever faced in my life. Uh, so I can't you know, boldly say that I'm building censorship resistance so software. And um, the unstoppable is nice, but Web2 tech is actually quite good. Uh, it's pretty robust. In fact, Web3 tech cannot match up to Web2 today from a performance perspective. So I would say uh, that is the facet of decentralization where uh, I think trust in society is at an all-time low. And what you read uh, in the media, in the newspapers, politicians, everyone has an agenda. And uh, you know, it comes down to elections, vaccina vaccines, um, oil. Uh, so we do tar sands in, in Canada. Uh, everything is, a, is just a mess. So to understand what is true is a, a challenge. And I think decentralization can, can help with that. I will let this close now, um, but first I will ask if anybody has any closing thoughts they want to share. Um, Peter, Connor, Jen. Closing thoughts that you want to share. Any final words of wisdom? Yeah, I think from, from my side, like I'm very excited uh, for the next couple of years. I think that we're um, you know, heading into sort of a space now where uh, I recognize a lot of the faces that I see. Like I think um, a lot of the builders who stuck around over the past two years are, um, it's like a trial by fire, right? And I think that, um, I'm very excited to see the use cases that are built. And, and just to touch on that question about decentralization, like I view Web3 as sort of like a uh, spectrum, right? So you can get like very decentralized or very permissioned. And I think today off-chain data and data transport is a very permissioned piece of the infrastructure. So for us, like we don't think that any one company should stand in the way of the free flow of data. So we want to make sure that we have a layer that's fully permissionless, anyone can plug into, and we're able to serve data anywhere without having to be a gatekeeper or middleman between that. So um, yeah, just super excited to see what developers are gonna build with Sato when we go live in about a month and a half. And um, yeah, thank you so much.
Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you all for listening.